Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Agatha Caraballo, and thank you for joining us for today's leadership lecture um, with town manager Rafael Casals from Cutler Bay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. You've been a wonderful supporter of our department, um, of our Pi Alpha Alpha Honor Society, and of course we have exciting developments now with ICMA at FIU. Um, welcome, uh, Manager Casals, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having me, anytime. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead. I'll post your bio um, in the chat. Um, if you like, I'll go ahead and just share a few words. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Manager Casals is the manager of the town of Cutler Bay, which is located in South Miami-Dade County. Um, Mr. Casals was part of the core group of department heads when the town was first incorporated in 2005, at which point he served as the town's pub first public works director. I'll let you go ahead and tell a little bit more about your background and your public service journey. Okay, well, great, thank you. I mean, it's one of those journeys that I'm gonna start dating myself. I started when I was 17 years old, a senior at Homestead Senior High, so go Broncos, right? Or I was lucky enough to have a, a, a part-time position with the city of Florida City in their finance department. And, and Mayor Wallace is actually still the mayor there when he hired me back in 1985. And, uh, and, and it was basically a, a situation where I was just lucky to get my foot in the door at $4 an hour, you know? And, and now look at me, right? <laughs> uh, you know, less hair, but, you know, but still, you know, I mean, it's, it's great. It's a, uh, Mayor Wallace is a great mentor and he actually calls me now for advice. So imagine that the person who hired you in 85 now calling you for, for some advice and, and we share the same, you know, uh, uh, issues and concerns as, you know, growing up and being raised down in, in the Homestead area. Uh, I was there for 13 years and, it, and the highlight of my 13 years is a little storm called Hurricane Andrew. So, so here I am in my, in, in my mid twenties, here comes Hurricane Andrew and, and here we are, you know, trying to rebuild the municipality and flying Black Hawk helicopters to the old Eastern building every night and dealing with three-star generals trying to rebuild the town. And if you know anything about Florida City, it's, you know, really one of the, you know, poor areas of Dade County. And so we didn't have a lot of resources. We had to depend a lot on, on other municipalities and other agencies and, and uh, 10th Mountain Division from, from uh, New York as well. Uh, then briefly there, I think that was like my, I call it my college education. Now, obviously, I went, you know, Miami-Dade Community College when it was back in the Air Base. And then I went to uh, Florida Atlantic University. Sorry, but, you know, Pell Grant's a Pell Grant, you know, so go Owls. So uh, Florida Atlantic University and, and something that's, it, it was instilled in me by the Mayor Wallace was that he allowed me to be flexible with my schedule to allow me to get my education. I, and I, to this day, I, I do the same thing with my staff as well. I think it's very, very important you know, uh, to get that. But at the same time, I think it's even more important to be in the field that, that you know, you know in, in the field that you're in. You know, for example, um, if you are a pharmacist, you don't wanna be you know, involved in local government, for example, right? So I always tell people, try to get into that field because then it kind of, you can connect the dots of what that professor is teaching you, you know, at night or during the day. You say, oh, that's what that is. Okay, I, I get that because I apply that skill every day. Uh, and then after my career in Florida City, I went and became a city manager in the city of North Bay Village, you know, up in, up in you know, by Miami Beach. And that was an experience, you know, traumatizing experience at age 26 because you're like, whoa, what's going on here? And I think something that I'm sure I don't get a lot of people that nod their heads is that you don't know how much you know until you go to another organization. And that was very evident to me when I went there, nothing against the staff that was there, but I'm like, wow, I learned a lot in the school of hard knocks, you know? So, so that's something that, that was instilled in me. And after my experience in North Bay Village, which as a cycle of a manager, you, you get hired and then you either leave on your own terms or get fired, right? In, in my in my situation was the resignation, right? So now you go through the whole psychological process of severance package. You go from a person that this phone rings constantly to the psychology of, okay, you're no longer relevant because you're no longer the manager. So I try to do, try to be that person that calls different managers throughout, you know, when something like that happens to them to this day. And say, hey, we're here to talk to you just to understand because remember, you're going from 85 phone calls a day to like two, you know, and the two that you would normally ignore, hey, honey, bring home milk, hey, you know, do this errand, what have you. Oh, I don't have time for that. Now that person, that family becomes more relevant, right? 
So I think that was something that I had to go through individually to understand it and in the psyche of, of what goes on with the manager, because it does affect you. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, after my career in, in, in North Bay Village, which is, you know, four and a half years, I uh, became assistant city manager for the town of Miami Lakes, which was very interesting because that's when it was first incorporated. Well, how often do you do that, right? I mean, you hear, you know, city of Miami over 100 years old, city of Homestead over 100 years old, other cities 90 years old, 80 years old. So wait, zero years old. So that was, that was a, a great challenge there, working with uh, another great uh, uh, mentor, Alex Ray, who was, a, the, who was a city manager there, the village manager there. Now he's in St. Pete Beach. And it's fun creating your own city. But all this time, living down in Homestead area. So when Cutler Bay Incorporated, I'm like, hey, I drive, it by, I drive by there every day by the turnpike. Uh, I reached out to their manager, Stephen Alexander, and we were able to, you know, at least bring me in as a public works director. I said, look, I, I understand, you know, I went from manager to a public works director, but I'm here. I've done that, been there, done that, right? And also in, in, in Miami Lakes, when I went in as an assistant manager and my role was like, you know what? I've been the head coach. I know what you need. I know what to, you expect. And here's what I'm going to give to you. So, and, and in Cutler Bay, you know, it was fun because we start off in October of 2006 as a core group. So just think about all these beautiful faces I see here on the Zoom. Imagine just throwing everybody in one room and say, hey, we're starting a city. You're like, wait, who are you? What are you? Who are you? So it takes some time. And until this day, we have like six or seven core employees out of the 32 that we have in Cutler Bay. So it was one of those, like, I know what to do now in Cutler Bay because I always tell people the joke is that I've done it wrong before, right? The 30 years experience that you've done it wrong before. So you know what to do or what to expect the, the next time. And that's the model that we, that we instilled in Cutler Bay. And, and to this day, we have a core group of staff. We have, uh, you know, 45,000 residents. We have only have 32 employees. So it's really fast paced, as you can see, you know, uh, it's really fast paced. And, and we, and we thrive on being that little speed ship versus that big, big freighter that takes so long to move. We move really quickly. So that's something that's very, very exciting. And, and my passion is always trying to give back because my boss, all my mentors had to be kind of like teachers. So to this day, I try to teach my staff. It's like, here's how you do this and, and think it through. So, so it's more of like a, a, a teaching, you know, if you're, if you're here with me, it's more of a, more of a, of, of a teacher than just telling you do this, do this. I'm telling you do this, but why? And think it through. I know you're getting it wrong, but I'm going to let you go through it so you understand it. So that's, that's the philosophy that's been instilled in me. And, and to this day, I'm, I mean, I'm very excited, even just getting involved with, with FIU and, and your program. I think it's, it, it's, in, it's great, um, especially for certified managers like myself uh, through the ICMA that you know, provide us, you know, internship hours that we have. I mean, I see uh, uh, Franz on the, on, on, on the Zoom there. So, you know, he got a good taste of me after some Cuban coffee. So he knows, he knows the pace. So, so we, we are ready. Uh, and, and again, I just want to open up to questions and kind of, there's a little bit of my experience, but I certainly want to, you know, uh, open up to questions. Thank you so much. I wanted to bring up um, one thing that you had mentioned. Of course, you mentioned that you are a credentialed manager. So would you tell a little bit about what that means? Sure. It was a grueling five hour test. No, <laughs> it, 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 it kind of, what it does, it's, one, when the program first came out, a lot of managers were kind of like, what is this, right? But then what, what dictates that is when you see a position open up for the city of blank, 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 and it says credential manager preferred. Uh-oh, what's that thing they're asking for, right? So I think it's, it was a, an, it's, it's all, all kidding aside, it was an assessment test that, that is done, administered through the International City Manager Association. It tests your skills in different categories. It's not a pass-fail. You know, to get to the, to take the test, to sit for the test, you have to have so many years of experience uh, as, a, as an assistant, as a manager. Uh, so then I was able to sit for the test and then it goes through different categories. And yes, it's over, you know, several hundred questions. And, and me and you might have different answers to it, but it's not a wrong answer. It's just different ways that we have different, maybe teaching philosophies or, or management philosophies. And then at the end, it gives you like, Okay, here's like a score, not a pass fail, but you know, you may want to have more emphasis on financial management, uh, uh, council manager relationships with the council, uh, 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 ethics, 
for example. So, so that was something that, that humbled me as an individual. And most importantly, to maintain that certification, you must have 40 continuous education hours per year. So what does that force you to do as a manager? To, God forbid, disconnect, go to a conference, learn with, from your peers, share stories, right? Get into a internship program, right? That'll provide you hours, what we're doing with, with FIU, and, and allows the manager just to kind of like disconnect a little bit and, and share stories and different philosophies and different uh, trends. Like, I mean, obviously right now, the hottest topic is the pandemic, but you know, uh, with, with other managers and you uh, have to get credits for those. So it forces you to do that. And so for those of you that may not have just been joining us, um, he's referring to ICMA, which is the International City County Management Association. Um, and we do have a new mentoring leadership program. Um, and because you mentioned being man matched with France Williams, um, France, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself in the ICMA at FIU and how uh, Mr. Casals has been an integral part of launching that program. Uh, definitely, definitely. So first and foremost, thank you, Rafael, and thank you, uh, Dr. Caraballo. Uh, I always, always am buoyed by these talks, kind of the live look into the city manager and town manager uh, life. But really, ICMA it stands for the International County and City Management Association. And here as the student president of the chapter at FIU, you know, my goal, uh, our goal is really to uh, better align us as students and future practitioners, even current practitioners, with some of the, the executive level experience of uh, Mr. Casals. So uh, that is my quick plug because I don't want to take away from this and I'll insert, uh, I'll put in my contact information uh, in the chat. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, that little plug as well. Um, I know we also see Nicole Regalado who was um, a Pi Alpha Alpha board member and also worked with uh, Manager Casals. Um, and the reason why I just bring this up is because you've been such an incredible supporter of our department and finding opportunities to network with students. Um, and talk a little bit about the students that have interned with you and again, how you, you continue to pay it forward. Yeah, I think, I think it's very important. I mean, I actually started several years ago when we actually had uh, high school 11th graders interning as well, you know, and, and it's something that the, the, my philosophy is, I'm not going to insult anybody's intelligence, you know, go make a copy of this. No, it's, here's what we need you to do. I need to develop a, a, a press release for the mayor regarding A, B, and C. Well, what do you want me to say? I just told you, figure it out. You know, and that's how you get teaching, uh, get the folks, you know, that, the interns to, to understand that. And then just, just follow me around and you'll see like, wow, oh my God, now I know why you don't have 20 seconds for somebody else. Because you know, I'm dealing with, you know, at least in our town, we have five council members. You know, we have a mayor, a vice mayor, and three council members, but some other municipalities have seven. So it's the art of constantly lobbying having your pulse on knowing what's going on in the community and, and catering to your, your council members needs, right? It's, it's amazing when I get a phone call from a resident and I call them back and like, wait, you're the town manager. I'm like, yeah, you called the town manager. Oh, I wasn't expecting the town manager to call me back. I was calling the manager's office to complain about something. I'm like, well, you got me. And then, and then to me, the most amazing part that my day is sitting there talking to someone and they go, oh, yeah, I know the house you live on. You live in the corner house with the blue pickup truck. They're, wow, you drive around? I'm like, yes, I drive around. So, so it's raising that bar of expectation, right? You know, uh, when I, I do an annual, we call it open mic night. And so my colleagues said, you're going to do what? I said, yes, I'm going to open up the, the council chambers. I'm going to have everybody come in. I can't solve world hunger, but I can solve other stuff within the municipality. And, and it's just myself, the microphone with the residents and the council members in the audience. And it's just basically the communi the residents just communicating with me, hey, you know, what's going on with this? What's going on with that? And, and you, it, it's funny because I would say maybe 60 to 70% of the items are rumors. Hey, I heard this. Call me. So I call them now as almost like rumor killers, you know, to the point that on our, on our, we have a new website that we just launched. And I'm going to put a little button there that says, hey, let me know what's the rumor of the day. You know, because that is rampant, right? Because, I mean, think about it in your personal life. When was the last time you picked up the phone and called your local government? Very rare you're going to call, hey, thank you for fixing that pothole, right? It's usually the other way around. So knowing that, knowing that that resident's coming there 
And, and I hate it just as you guys know, I mean, just call 1-800 whatever. And you're like, oh my God, how many times I got to tell the story? I know you're the first person. I'm not going to tell you the story because you're going to bounce me around, right? So that's what usually happens in government. And we try to, we try to pride ourselves. And I think uh, my administrative service director is on the, on the line here, Jasmine. And I have a famous saying, it starts with you, it ends with you. You were the first point of contract. So, so the receptionist needs to know what's going on in the town. The same thing when we start doing in our website, what's hot in the town, besides my PIO looking at social media pages, I asked my receptionist, who's the one answering the phone? What's hot? What's, what's trending, right? You know, kind of doing it old school at that point. So, and then dealing with the residents where you have some folks that are like completely tech savvy, but what I do somebody like my grandma who's 89 years old and wants services. You know, so, so you got to balance that out. And that's where I get my satisfaction. That's my driving force. Mentoring folks, uh, uh, you know, students, employees. You know, I see another staff member that I used to have here. I think uh, Missy Arocha was my executive assistant. Now she's the, the proud uh, city clerk of the village of Palmetto Bay. And, you know, went to the mass program. So that's another thing. So I know it's either two things. Either I'm mentoring really good or I'm getting old. <laughs> Speaking of, of mentoring, when you... Take, decide to take on mentors or you bring on new employees, what really um, helps the candidates stand apart and make themselves more competitive? I think the, the willingness to learn, you know, uh, uh, you know, you can see that I, I've been in enough interview panels that, that folks like, Hey, you know what? It's almost like, uh, like my lapel pin. Hey, I want to play for that team. Right. I've heard thing, you know, what did you hear? What, what is it about color Bay? You know, tell me, you know, and, and the, the, the candidates that impressed me the most are the ones that kind of done the research, right? You know, um, just like when I was, you know, talking to Franz, I said, listen, you know, you're not, you know, you're going to look at the glossy budget book, right? The way that we do our budget book and we, we win an award every year to the GFOA, Government Finance Officer Association, because the way I see it is that I try to break it down easy. I want to pick up that budget book in Cutler Bay and I'm sitting in Wisconsin. When I read that, I understand Cutler Bay. Sure, give me the pictures of the mirrors, you know, breaking ground, planting trees, and guys doing this and that. But give me, give me the rest of the story, right? So that's, but that's that's produced by the by by administration, right? Then the other part, I would sit there and tell. In fact, I was just telling one of my one of my uh, friends that is, uh, you know, a candidate for a, a, a manager job in another municipality. I said, read the CAFR. They go, what's the CAFR? All right, certified financial annual report. That is the independent audit, right? that is performed by uh, an, uh, an auditor every year for every municipality in the state of Florida. And then don't get caught up on the numbers. Listen, I'll give you a bunch of numbers. You're not memorizing the numbers. You want to see the controls, the balances, and what's the management report. You want to see, the, you wanna see the, the, the written text, not the numbers. And that'll give you a good feel of the municipality. Is that a good match or not? So, so going back to your question, I think it's the hunger. Is, is I, I, I can see with it, somebody that, I'm willing to turn it on. Let's, let's do it. Great question. Um, I'm going to go back just a moment to actually to Francis' question that he posted in the chat. Um, he had mentioned, you mentioned customer service excellence, um, just picking up the phone and responding directly to the needs of um, constituents. Um, is that common in local government in your experience? <laughs> I, I think it is. I mean, knowing the, the, my, my colleagues in government, I think what it is is the, the largest organization, right? Uh, it's hard to trickle down all the way, right? So I've been fortunate enough to be in small and medium-sized you know, municipalities. Although Cutler Bay is 45,000, we only have 32 uh, employees, right? It's still instilling, like me finding the time of day to talk to my public works staff to talk to my receptionist you know because i know when i was a uh, when i was just starting in government when i was you know again back in florida city you know 17 like oh my god the mayor came by and spoke to me he actually knew my name right how often does that happen in an organization right so so yes it's the whole cliche of family well you know what yeah okay but this is a family that you hire and fire right <laughs> right so so but it's it's treating that that way you know there, there might be days look I'm, and, I, and i've had that before my career I've gone to folks' uh, children's baptism. The next thing, we're in arbitration here because I'm, I'm letting that employee go. You know, so it's, care, it's keeping that balance. I think one of the satisfying things for me is, is not in this municipality, but another municipality where I had to terminate an employee, and three years later, I see this individual restaurant, and we're having a cordial conversation. 
you know, so that's, that's hard to do, you know, that's hard, to, that's hard to do. And I think that's the, the biggest thing in terms of customer service as they see it, where they see me talking to that resident and they understand it. Or when I left the town of Miami Lakes, so my colleagues there said, you know what, you know, boss, we're still using the same lines. I'm like, really? Yeah, I should have, you know, copyrighted it. I'm going to invite um, any students that have questions to go ahead and post them in the chat. Um, in the meantime, we had mentioned, um, obviously, because of the, the pandemic, that a lot of meetings have, like these, have been moved to Zoom. Um, do you find that that's increased citizen participation um, in, in council meetings? I think, I think for us in Cutler Bay, I, I think so. Um, uh, just like Zoom, when we have Adobe Connect, uh, just our platform and I can see as an administrator how many folks are on and and I see a lot more participation It's it's the convenience factor obviously, right? Uh, you know, and, and we see ourselves moving to that I, I'm actually challenging my staff to figure out how we could do that where my ideal council meeting is that I have You know again depends if the state law gets changed at least three members of the, of the, of the council in a quorum in physically in person and then two other members just uh, here's a TV screen, right? And, and when we open up the public comment, I want to see the soccer moms, you know, say, hey, I have a comment about item number blank, 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 as long as they're not saying, wait, Junior, score that goal, right? I just want to make sure because it gives more accessibility, right? Just like now, imagine trying to get everybody together now. Oh, sorry, we're, you know, traffic and, and think about the less carbon footprint that we're leaving as well. So to me, it's accessibility. So, so again, going back to my open mic nights, well, you know what, I could have open mic night and you could be in Orlando and we're chatting just like this, you know, and, and then you turn off the phone and you go on to what you're doing. So I think for, for, for the managers, we have to change with the times, right? And I think that's very critical for us that we um, accept that, right? And balance the, the effects. Some folks, even when we open up, look, just yesterday, the governor extended the virtual meetings uh, for all the municipalities to November the 1st at 4.55 p.m. and it was gonna expire at midnight. So now we have to adjust and okay, hey, guess what? There's just another meeting, but it's challenging for, some, for us, for example, we have our annual state of the town address. Well, how do you do, you know, pomp and circumstance and I call it the shrimp and the food and, you know, uh, on Zoom, right? So that's a new challenge. That's a new challenge, you know? So, so we have to change the times, at least me personally, if you would ask me that six months ago, I'm like, okay, how do you do the Zoom thing again? Now I'm like, hey, wait a minute. I, 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 I just kind of get used to this, you know? Am I wearing shorts or not? We won't know unless you stand up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another great question um, from France. Um, obviously, with everything that's going on with county, state, and now federal, um, how do you remain apolitical as a town manager? Um, I think it's, it's honesty, you know, being honest. Um, um, when there's good news, I spread it. When there's bad news, I let the council know about it, you know, and the, and the accountability. Um, you know, treat all 45,000 residents like they're your boss. Any one of them can be, right? Uh, don't choose sides, you know, stay as, as, apolitical as you can, that's a trick for survival. You know, I mean, I've been in situations that says, hey, you know what, I'm running for office. If I win, uh, we want to change this. I'm like, okay, well, thank you, but uh, get that victory first, you know? So, so, you, so you have that, so you have to be, you have to have a lot, a lot of patience and just, you know, deliver the bad news just as you would the good news. Speaking of which, um, you mentioned earlier on in your career that you obviously coming in, starting your career during Hurricane Andrew, um, and now going to um, dealing with COVID-19. What are some of the other challenges that you've faced during your career? Well, I, oh, I, see now being uh, tech savvy, I see uh, Sylvia just posted a question, right? <laughs> which is kind of like, kind of lines over what you're saying, right? Well, think about what we, I think one of our, one of our great accomplishments is the accomplishment that we did this year. Okay, think about this from the textbook version, right? Pandemic year, people unemployed, right? The economy, you know, the way it is, receiving uh, news from the state of Florida that we're gonna be receiving about approximately a million dollars less a year, you know, because of the pandemic. Because think about it, um, what's the last time you filled up your car? 
we get gas tax, right? Well, you know, we're not going to, we're not spending as much money at restaurants, which means sales tax. So our particular hit is, and then I was telling the council is, is you know, we, we're going to lose about, I, was, I said a million, but it's not, like $980,000, but we'll use a million dollars, right? So one of the proudest moments that I have with our team right now is raising the millage rate in a pandemic year, in an election year, right? And issuing uh, over $15 million worth of bonds in an election year. So if you would have asked me this like six months ago, I said, well, it's an uphill battle. But you know what? We, our team, myself, the finance director, our financial advisor, our, our, our bond counsel, the attorneys, you know, uh, provided each council member and briefed each council member individually. And some of them took a, a, maybe two hours to brief to understand what we're doing with the taxpayer's money. Okay. And again, you know, God forbid you'd raise taxes, right? But, but the, the, the satisfying thing for me was, and, and surprising for the town, town uh, council was when we had our budget meetings and budget workshops, we had a lot of folks listening, but then when it came to public comment, they, they understood. So what that means for me is the ultimate stamp of approval is that they trust our elected officials. They trust administration. One of the things that we're very, very proud of is just recently uh, the uh, House of Representatives put out a report card. We were ranked number one in terms of government size out of 90 cities in the state of Florida. And we were ranked number one in terms of government spending. Now, as a manager, I'm like, wow, where'd that come from? You know, I say, wait a minute. I mean, an independent report, right? I mean, I think we're number one in all the categories. I mean, they had other categories like schools and crime. I think we're like number 12, but I think it was five categories. Out of the five, we have two number one categories. Wait, Color Bay, 32, 32 employees, the newest kid in the block, right? As I call it, the newest kid in the block, because we recently incorporated the municipality. So the point that we know that there's been a lot of areas in the county that want to incorporate, right? You know, like the falls and some other areas in North Dade. They come and speak to us. Hey, let me see your model. What's your model? You know, we contract out our police department. So as a manager in my toolbox, from my police chief, right, to the officer, they're literally one email away from me sending an email to the directors, please remove officer ABC, right? Um, is it more expensive than creating your own? Sure, but I have the best police department money can buy because they are Miami-Dade County Police Accredited Association. They worry about the recruiting and everything else. If this would be just the Cutler Bay Police Department, we would have only 55 officers. That makes us a small uh, police, off, police department. And then you have these, these recruits come out of the academy, they wanna go to a larger department. So, so I think that's something that we will continue to do. In fact, we just renewed our contract with them. Uh, our building department, our building department, we contract out the inspection service and the plan review service, and we have a 70-30 split. Every permit that comes in, that contract gets 70% and we get 30%. We provide them the computers, the, 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 the town hall space, you know, so, and they have to worry about the liability insurance. So you try to run it like a business. Our IT department, right, that's led through by our administrative services director, Jasmine Gonzalez, we actually contracted like three years ago with Miami County IT. So they say, hey, who's your IT department? It's the entire county, IT's department. Uh, our, our circulator transit bus is operated by Miami County Transit Department. So certain things, again, we're, we're saying big government could do it a little bit better and more efficient. So we pick and choose those. So I hope that answers the question. And that's a good point because it really brings up um, how procurement and contracting works, not only with um, private sector, but also within public sector, um, how you guys can share resources. Um, I'm going to go back to the chat for just a moment. Um, Nicholas asks, what are some of the necessary competencies and soft skills um, you think are most effective in being a city manager? Patience. Patience, don't take anything personal. Thick skin, right? And, and you are uh, your lobbying skills, right? You know, you have to convince, you know, five members to, you know, certain way. But I think, I think you also create a, a path for those elected officials because remember, they're going to be term limited out. And one of the things that we do very good here in Cutler Bay is that we have a lot of master plans, 
So for example, how do you know what street gets resurfaced next year? Well, is it because, you know, Bob lives there? No, because we have a master plan. We have a plan that ranked all the different streets and we prioritize the streets based on the color coding or number coding or, or, or what have you. And so you rank that, you know, when, how do you know what's the next street you're going to uh, put in trees? We have a, a street straight cape master plan. Same thing with flooding. So we, ha we, we try to buy into the master plan and then, and then leading up to the master plan, we have a lot of public meetings. So the master plan is really the public choosing, right? We kind of guide them, right? And then we, then we go through that process. Like, well, why does that neighborhood get new sidewalks? Well, because the other neighborhood, you know, is, is, uh, has estate homes and there might be some conflict. So, so we try to buy in with, 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 uh, with master plans. So I think that's been our success. And that almost, in a sense, addressed um, Michelle's um, question in the sense of how do you prioritize when there's so many commute, um, competing, you know, interests. And that kind of, like you mentioned, public comment. Um, the squeaky wheel gets the oil um, at one point or another. That's why it's so important for us to speak up and to participate in our community's um, decision making. Um, something that kind of Philip and Tatiana brought up, um, as far as for virtual externships um, and perhaps student joint projects. And again, that kind of cycles back to the project that we're doing with ICMA um, to develop mentorships. Um, so anybody that is interested in those programs, please see the chat and reach out to um, either myself or um, Dr. Fraser, Dr. Chang, and we'll be happy to give information about these um, virtual internships, externships, um, leadership programs that we're really developing to match our students up with um, managers to learn. No, ab absolutely. I see another question here from, I think it was uh, Philip. That's a, a great question of, you know, give you an example of how these opportunities for students to process joint research projects. I, I think that that's, that's amazing because one of the things that, that I've always been an advocate of is that why should I sit there as a manager and pay consultant Q, nothing against the consultants, right? When I have a whole think tank at local universities, right? Uh, uh, in fact, it's, it, uh, we were just talking about that the other day internally of our strategic master plan is getting ready to be uh, get renewed. Well, you know what? I mean, nothing against the, the gentleman who did it before, you know, which was, I think it did an amazing job, which was Merritt Sterheim, right? But I said, you know what? Why don't you give the opportunity to have like 25 different views and manage that, right? So that way, for me, my goal is to get these interns ready so when they're interviewing across from one of my counterparts, hey, you know what, I worked on the town's master plan, right? And they go, oh yeah, okay. Uh, so those are the kind of things that I, I wanna try to do. And at the same time, have that experience. One of the things that we were just tossed around in, internally was, you know, we just purchased 16 acres on Old Cutler Road for our future town hall. And, and one of the things that we're contemplating is doing a, a worldwide competition right, of having all these schools of architecture and, uh, and uh, to develop a plan, right, uh, that, that will be sold to the public and, and the winner gets a stipend, you know. So, I mean, those are the kind of the crazy things that we want to do to try to connect, you know, the, the local universities. And I think, I mean, FIU does a great uh, job with it. I know that you have FIU, the Metropolitan Center. You know, and I think there's more opportunities, but a lot of times, you know, managers are either like, oh, do I have the time for this or no, or what's the product going to be? And that's where I think, you know, with, with Dr. Carballo and Dr. Chan, I think we're, it's been challenging it, it, and challenge the students. I mean, I, I want to try to do that because you know what? It's a win-win. Win for the student. They get a real life example, right? It's not like you're reading, hey, back in 1984, the city of Minneapolis did this. No, no, this is live. We're doing it right now, you know, and, and run it. And, and the town just kind of sits back and kind of like nudges, like, I can envision uh, a strategic master plan, you know, getting feedback from residents and, uh, and all my, all the interns there getting that information, but you got to understand the town, right? So there has to be a lot of homework beforehand. So that's one of my visions. I think that's where you could do. And then going back to the electronic, I mean, it's funny, I was just, before this meeting, we were, I was just talking to my community development director about, about Airbnb, what are the registration rates, what are the fees, what are other cities doing? And that's a great research assignment there for someone that they could be doing in the living room, right? Uh, on our behalf or, or writing, a, uh, or we're considering doing a, a brownfield rezoning, you know, designation on some of the areas in the town. Okay, well, you know, two weeks ago, what's a brownfield, right? I can spell it, but there's a whole research there. 
and different examples. So, so I, I, I get that. And I think we try to use that skill. I try to use that skill um, when, when developing any type of legislation and or resolutions. And I just wanted to circle back to what you said earlier, as far as for when you interview candidates, those who are knowledgeable and have shown that they've done their research of the community. And I'm just going to ask the students on um, in the participants list to kind of indicate it with a yes, if you've ever reviewed a city's master plan. Um, and again, if you're ever applying for a job with the community, that would be a good place to kind of to start. And as far as um, we mentioned as far as for qualities and values that you look for, obviously preparation, um, a willingness to learn. Um, one thing that you kind of had mentioned is as we look at our certificates, what do you anticipate as one of the growing areas um, for public service for um, students who are seeking um, opportunities in, in this area? I think, I think, I think it's, I think it's two. I, it's the, the financial side and also the resiliency side okay uh, i think those are those two uh, important you know factors uh going to the the financial side understanding that you know you 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 know everybody the tax, you got to treat the dollars like if they were your dollars number one right and and then understanding what other types of funding sources are out there right i use an example brownfield you know i mean so so uh, that's something there. And then Franz is drinking Cuban coffee from me, man. It's killing me. Not anyway. <laughs> I know you got me. No, I just messed with him. So Come over. Come over. I got a second cup. Come over. Oh, no. My cup staff for would, everyone. Cup for everyone. My staff wouldn't want that, believe me. Not at uh, 3 o'clock, you know. No, but um, I think it's, it's, it's the connection, right? It's understanding the community. We have an amazing, amazing uh, grant writer, right, that gets it because she's been involved with me with all the master plans. So you get all the master plans, you understand the finances, you understand, again, maybe the resiliency project or stormwater project, right? And then you make that connection. So just last year, we received over $11 million worth of grants. And I always tell people, because why? We get it, right? We get it because think about it. I always tell my staff, think about if you're responding to an RFP or to a grant or to the interview, right? Don't give me your canned resume, tailor it to Cutler Bay, right? Again, the grants, it's I'm asking someone to give me something, just like an interview. I'm, I'm selling myself so you could give me a job, right? The grant, I am selling you the reason why this storm drain is so important in the Saga Bay community because the pollutants that get discharged to Biscayne Bay, which, which is a, a, a Biscayne Bay, which we all know what's going on with Biscayne Bay, at the body of water and then getting the, the scientific data of it is saying these are all the, so many different particles per million going to, and then boom, all that is a short version. And we received a $600,000 grant to do a drainage project and leveraging the money, right? We leverage 600,000, we get 600,000. So now it's a $1.2 million project because why? That area was in a repetitive loss zone, which was adopted in the, master plan by the town council which was a result of several public meetings so what does the grant agency want government uh, town uh community involvement right and and that's how we get it so i think those two is the finance side and again the clip notes is understand what a CAFR is right and and the other part is knowing what's the resiliency part of it you know because remember resiliency is not just that it's financial resiliency you know uh, community resiliency uh, so it's, it's a lot, oh, I think those are the two. Awesome. I'm going to uh, go to David Ortiz's question in the chat. Um, he mentions, being a suburban community, how does the town of Cutler Bay mediate between surrounding metropolitan growth and the need to accommodate future housing demands um, as mandated by Florida's comprehensive planning? And the desire, of course, to maintain that small town feel. Right. So... In Cutler Bay, that's always been the old age, right? We're a, a medium city of 45,000 residents. We can only control behind me that map, right? And that map has, hey, there you go. I'm used to teleprompter there. Anyway, so that map there, and, and it has, you know, the red lines. I always tell my staff, we can only control what's in the red lines, right? But outside of that is you have more growth, right? So going back to that question, uh, I'm here. I don't want anybody else here, right? So I don't want any more growth. 
but I'm here. Okay, well, but you want more services, so we're going to get it from somewhere, right? Uh, so that's always been the, the balancing act. Number two, traffic, 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 right? If we don't approve any other permits in Cutler Bay, the traffic is still coming. It's going to continue to come from all the areas around us, right? And what's causing it? What's causing it is track developments. It's a thousand people a day moving to the state of Florida, right? Who wouldn't want to live here, right? Moving to the state of Florida. And then you also have other forces. Well, and at least in Cutler Bay in the South Bay community from Metro Rail all the way from Dayland all the way to Florida City, you have this thing called the bus rapid transit, the transit way, BRT as we refer to it, right? Okay. And there you are having now transit oriented development. TODs, right? So how do you justify spending millions and millions and millions of dollars, not just on, on fancy buses like BRT, but folks wanted some light rail? Well, you have to have density. Wait, density means development. Yeah. Density means high rises. Yes, but but I want the train, but I, I want I don't want the high rises. So where's that balancing act, right? And you can only control what's in our town. And I can tell you our council has been very, very courageous. If they don't like a development, they turn it down. They say, you know what, we'd rather have that parcel empty. Some cities may not. Financially, they might say, okay, we're going to accept that. You know, and, and then how do you con continue with that small town feel? The small town feel is I still say, yes, we're 45,000 residents, but you know what? We still treat it like Mayberry. Call the front desk, they give it to me. You know, and, and I think that's, that's, an, that's important for that we instill in our staff. But I think, you know, with the comprehensive plan, it's sensible development. Uh, and just controlling the, what you can do there. And again, sensible development based on your comprehensive plan is based on your plan. What's the vision for the town? You know, what's the vision for the town? I mean, I have some residents, you know, Cutler Bay, old Cutler Road, God forbid you put 29 homes there, but you know what? You could put 5,000 units in the old Southland Mall area, right? Because it's away from us. And I guess kind of on that line, um, mentioning, are there any plans to expand affordable housing and um, what does that amount to for the residents? Yeah, our, our council has been very aggressive on that. Uh, for example, you know, what makes the development attractive to the developer for affordable housing, right? Okay, so that's always been, that's always been the, the pickle, as I call it, right? Um, I could tell you for us, we try to tackle that with senior housing, at least in for Cutler Bay. We know that we have a lot of, uh, we, you know, we just received the, the uh, award from American Plan Association for our communities for a lifetime age friendly plan. So we get it. We will understand that our residents um, um, love Cutler Bay so much that they're, they're born here, raised here, and they end up going to the home here, right? It's, right? So we got to age in place. And one of the things that our council has been very aggressive on is how do you make that attractive, right, for senior housing, for example. Because at least in Color Bay, uh, we have like six centers and there's like a three-year waiting list, right? Because why? That's a tribute to what we're doing in Color Bay. It's safe. They love the amenities. They love our parks. Uh, their family lives around here. And one of the things that we've done is actually relaxed our code when it comes to senior housing for the amount of parking spaces that they need. You know, typical apartment in Cutler Bay would need you know, 2.5 parking spaces. You know, don't quote me, but something like that. You know, uh, so what we did to incentivize that to attract senior housing developments, we said, you know what, if you are a senior housing development, you have to show the proof that you are, um, you will only need one parking space. As a result, we were able to attract a developer along the transit way. Remember that. TOD, transit oriented development, right? It just happened to be that they had a sliver of property there that they were able to, and we approved it for a 99 uh, apartment complex there, uh, five, six stories on the transit way. So, so that was something that we were very proud of. Now, again, if you know Cutler Bay, we have the whole Southland Mall area, which is an opportunity zone, which that's a different topic in itself, but that's another an opportunity. So we got Brownfield opportunity zones, right? There you go. All right, so Franz, taking notes, right? Okay, so 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 those are the kind of thing. Those are the two. That's, that's an opportunity zone and a brownfield area for the, the entire mall. Which, if you know where Southland Mall is, it's completely been rezoned since 2007, more dense than Dayland. Picture Dayland, more dense. Now, that looks great, 
as a bureaucrat, we sit there and show you the video and do all these things. But then now when you sit there and we actually reach out to developers, okay. So Mr. Manager, so you can build up to 20 stories there, right? Yeah, okay, so okay. The, so that means the person living in the 19th floor is gonna pay $3,400 a month? Ain't gonna happen. $3,400 a month, I'm buying a house, right? So, so that's where you kind of figure out where that, where's that tipping point, 13 stories, you know, a mixed use. So we know that's coming. Uh, one of the good things if it occurs from the pandemic is that unfortunately what's going on with regional malls, right? I mean, look at how they land and reinvent themselves, dealership restaurants, right? So we know, we know that this area is going to completely be redeveloped here. One of the unfortunate things or fortunate things, depending on which, which way you see it, is that uh, the Southland Mall has went into receivership, meaning that they weren't able to pay their loans. So now it's in the receivership. So just, it's, I always tell people it's like kind, of, kind of like a fancy foreclosure, right, for, for commercial. So we know that that area is going to be completely redeveloped there for some type of midtown or, or something. It's coming. It's coming. So, so that's something that's exciting for us. No, that is. That's really um, something you mentioned earlier, obviously, that you only are able to control what are in the boundaries of the town of Cutler Bay. Um, what's your relationship with leaders in, in neighboring municipalities? Do you and the other managers communicate and work together? Yeah, we yeah, we communicate all the time. Uh, you know, we have city manager association meetings. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'm that old guy. I've actually been the president twice, you know, so so we try to communicate and 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 Keep it professional, right? Because there might be some times that elected officials may not, you know, they, they might clash on something, uh, but we still keep it professional, you know? I mean, again, you know, uh, I'm serving, you know, uh, my five bosses and, and, and the other, other managers might, you know, serving five or seven, and, and we understand it, just keeping it, you know, cordial as we can, not that we have a lot of disagreements, uh, but, you know, um, I think it's important enough to, to look, you can't control the development that goes on in other municipalities or along around the county. What we try to do is make sure outside our red lines, but we try to make sure that that we address the needs for regional transportation, right? I mean, you know, there could be a whole segment about Metro versus light rail versus bus rapid transit. Well, you know what? We understand that we were a uh, uh, good example, you know, our friends to the north were, you know, uh, BRT, we were light rail, and then we had our friends all the way to the south, the city of Homestead was, you know, BRT, and we were kind of stuck in the middle, you know, and, and we were able to, to compromise and understand, and now, as a result, there's going to be, I call it the world-class bus rapid transit from Metro all the way down to Florida City in the tune of $300 million, you know, and that's going to be occurring within the next two years. Uh, Sure. Are we still licking our wounds in terms of a metro rail, light rail? Yes. But again, remember that old thing that I was talking about in terms of density? Well, you need the density for that type of rail system, right? Because you're competing with other cities throughout the country with the FTA, Federal Transit Authority, to compete for those dollars. But yeah, but I don't want to look like Dayland all the way from metro rail all the way down to Florida City, right? So, so you have that you have that uh, you have that debate, right? So for us in Cutler Bay, we're very fortunate. We're going to have four stops. Okay, we're going to have four stops. They're going to be iconic, I think. Um, um, you know, we have our our municipal circulator bus is going to be feeding it. So my goal is feed that machine, feed it, feed it, feed it, right? You know, and then worry about internal circulation within the town. And we were able to secure a grant from DOT for two hundred thousand dollars for the next. Uh, well, it's a funny story. It was $200,000 for the first year. And they love our plan so much that they actually wrote us a letter saying, you know what, we're going to give you for three years. I'm like, you're going to do what? Okay, we'll take that credit. You know? So, so again, that's another tribute of how, how you know, we get it. And to feed that, the name of the game with, with transit is, again, remember, Miami-Dade County Transit operates my transit system. So we are going to be launching here pretty soon, the next month, what we call a pilot program. What that means, and I call it in, you know, I think Jasmine's still on the line, you know, and Ralph talk is, Somebody's going to pick you up in your door. It's like a fancy government Uber, right? That you call, it's going to pick you up, and it's going to take you to the transit way. Okay, now what we're trying to negotiate is I wanted to pick you up and take you to Publix. You know, the little, the little short trips, right? So, so that's something that we're trying to do is trying to move people around that way.
No, that sounds really exciting. I'm, I'm glad that you know you're sharing all these ideas as we're working. You know, many students in my capstone classes. Um, same thing. We ask them to identify a need in a community, a problem, and find creative, innovative solutions like that. Um, wanted to open it up for any last questions um, and as well as any last thoughts um, just on your leadership philosophy um, and just any parting advice to those who aspire to serve in a leadership role. Well, I mean, I think, I think uh, it's, it's get involved. You know, get involved, know your local government. I mean, I remember when I was in one of your sessions there at NFIU, right? Back in the day, we'd be socialized, right? I remember asking that question. So, so um, you folks want to be a manager. Okay, so raise your hand if you've been to a local, one of your local council meetings. All right, there we go. There we go. See, there we go. There we go. So, so that's, that's a start and get involved, right? Challenge, ask the questions, right? You know, look at the, look at the CAFR, right? Look at the budget. You know, understand, get involved in any type of uh, advisory committee, you know, uh, you know, you try to get involved that way. And obviously, I think it's going to, a lot of opportunities are going to open up now that we're going to have the, the internship program with a lot of the managers, right? I mean, I think for managers, it's something that we certainly want to give back. But if you ask me to develop the program, you're still waiting, right? Because I saw one of the questions there on the side, like, how do you prioritize everything that's the number one priority? Well, everything's the number one priority, right? You know, I mean, I give you a good example. You know, you have council member X or the mayor. Hey, whenever you get a minute, can you check on this? Guys, that's code. Do it now. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, know? you know, no, I don't have a minute. I'll get back to you in a month. All right. So, so I think it's, it's, it's understanding being reactive and, and providing that accurate information. But I mean, again, uh, to me, I, I love the fact when folks ask me questions. I mean, I remember just going to one of your other uh, uh, meetings there and we had a panel of managers. I remember it was you know, manager Weston, Alex Ray, myself, and, and I just get more off of just ask, you know, people ask me questions, you know, I mean, because, you know, I, mean, I have all this crazy information in my head, but I, I, how do I share it? So I don't know. So I always tell people, don't be scared to ask questions. Don't be scared. I completely agree with that. I share the same message to my students. Asking a question will only help you stand out and show that you're engaged and interested. So, um, you know, definitely I hope that if you're interested in learning more about the town of Cutler Bay, please reach out to Manager Casals, join the council meetings. Um, again, as he mentioned, um, review the CAFR and the comprehensive master plan. Um, and seek out opportunities in your own communities. Again, there's always a need for community boards, volunteers, participation. Um, it's really a way to, to learn firsthand and to help you stand out, um, you know, for positions when they do become available. Right. And I saw one, I uh, saw a last question from David Ortiz. How it, has it been the census 20,000, 2020 census? Well, I can tell you, um, uh, you know, we actually were one of the municipalities that received a grant, remember that word again, grant, from the Miami Foundation for you know uh, twelve thousand dollars to help us uh, increase our our census rate. So I challenged my staff because ten years ago our our census response rate was seventy percent. Okay, so we know that we're more than forty five thousand residents, but you know how do you how do you quantify that? And right now we are actually uh, I think the first place is our our friends from Palmetto Bay, uh, Pinecrest. And then I think we're ranked number third. So what do we do? Our, our mayor, he, he's very, very personable. So he launched, we launched a media campaign. So, hey, I don't like being number three. You know, I like being number one. And we have the standing, standing uh, uh, um, competition with our friends from Pinecrest and Palmetto Bay. And those mayors talk all the time and said, look, whoever is the winner is going to buy each other drinks. Right. So, so again, that's how he associates that. But I think more importantly than he just recorded a, a new Facebook message that said, Hey, by the way, right now, I'm proud to say that we're at 76%. We're still number three, but we've been creeping up. And, and the message that the mayor put out is that, Hey, for every person that's undercounted means about approximately $1,400 worth of less revenue for us. So what's that? What's 25%, 25, 25, percent of our population times one hundred thousand four four hundred dollars right so he's quantifying that he's pushing out that message pushing out that message so i think that's very important because that that is our our revenue most people think that we receive our revenue from ad valorem taxes the millage rate 
not true. And at least in Cutler Bay, that's about maybe like 26%. Okay. The rest of the revenue that we receive, a lot of it is from the state of Florida, which is called the revenue sharing. It's based on a formula based on population, sales tax, gas tax. Uh, that's the type of taxes you get based on your population. So that's how important it is for us. So hopefully we would like to be in that 53, 54, thousand range you know so that's how important the census is for us but that was a great question in terms of census because you only get to do that once every 10 years and again it's so important you know that we all understand where the money is actually coming from and how important it is to be counted um definitely so that fantastic question thank you david um at this point i would like everyone to please join me in the reactions and giving mr casals a big round of applause and thanking him for his time and expertise and sharing it with us today um, again, I know you have a lot of um, responsibilities and priorities, so we really appreciate you taking the time to join us this afternoon. Yeah, no, any, any time, and thank you, you know, Dr. Caballo and Dr. Chen. I mean, I think it's going to be uh, incredible when we start this internship program, I think. And I think, you know, in this world of Zoom that we are, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of managers who would love to give back this way as well. So don't be afraid to ask. I mean, we're certainly going to have some introduction at the City Marriage Association meeting. And, and I think it's very, very convenient, you know, for men. There's a lot of folks that want to share. Fantastic. Thanks again. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you for your fantastic questions. Um, and again, don't forget to just get involved and reach out um, and look forward to seeing you again at the next leadership lecture. Thanks again. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.